Um, just for the very few who were not uh, there in the morning, my name is Delina Fico. I am an NSSR alumni and a TCDS alumni. I also uh, am part of the NSSR Europe Collective, and it will be my pleasure to facilitate the last session today, which is about uh, the sixth edition of the Courage in Public Scholarship Award uh, bestowed by uh, NSSR Europe. Uh, but before we start that, we actually have a little bit of an appetizer and uh, before, the, before the ceremony starts, and I will invite Jacek Koltan from the European Solidarity Center for that. Please, Jacek. With uh, uh, actually with the husband of uh, of Elizabeth Martinia, <laughs> with Richard uh, Adams, who uh, who was awarded with the Medal of Gratitude by the European Solidarity Center 2021. As you can remember, it was the time of of COVID pandemic, and we did not have an opportunity to meet together, and I did not have the opportunity to give you. Richard, the middle of gratitude. Uh, before I do it, I need to read a formula because it's the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the uh, um, performative uh, reality, uh, which Elzbieta knows very well. <laughs> uh, the Gdańsk agreement signed on the uh, last day of August 1980 was the first powerful community experience behind the Iron Curtain of people aware of their rights who yearn for freedom. The revolution that began over 40 years ago led to the round table talks and to the free elections in Poland. These events inspired many Eastern Bloc Europeans who courageously stood up for human rights in their homelands. Dear Richard, you directly witnessed and actively participated in these events. Not only did you publicize the Solidarność activities but by, by translation of texts and organizing meetings in New York, but also we owe you one of the best documentaries dedicated to Solidarność history, Citizens, an American film portrayal of Polish solidarity. You have devoted your life to stand up for universal human rights and the spirit of solidarity ideals, promote the idea of solidarity and work for understanding between nations. What is particularly vital is your direct and indispensable support for Solidarność, especially during the dark times of the martial law. To express how deeply we appreciate your long-standing commitment to the democratization of Poland in the spirit of solidarity and American-Polish dialogue, we have awarded you with the Medal of Gratitude, an honorable distinction for foreigners who supported Poland in its struggle for freedom and democracy during the communist dictatorship and have helped to build social and moral order uh, based on dialogue for many years to come. I'm very honored and privileged, but also I feel great joy um, to bring the middle today to Wrocław and to give it to you. Thank you very much. between me and Elzbieta because we decided as we were wrapping up the film in 1985 or 86 that we might be jeopardizing members of the family or friends in Poland by putting her name on the film, whereas she was really the backbone of the film in terms of the information and everything. But it was a, a, a nice collaboration. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Jacek. And thank you to the European Solidarity Center. And so we begin. It is my pleasure to invite on the stage uh, Robert Kostreva, NSSR's vice dean. Uh, Robert has been with the New School for 25 years now. And one thing that he is very faithful to, he comes always to the last party of the Democracy and Diversity <laughs> Institute. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, so now that we have the appetizer, uh, very moving. Um, it's only one hour that separates us from the dessert. Um, <laughs> and that's what you've been waiting for, the dessert, which is uh, your performance of this uh, ancient Polish dance, the Polonaise. <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, uh, I am uh, choreographically challenged. <laughs> Um, so in many years of coming to this uh, uh, final party, um, I always try to hide in the deepest crevices of, of the event's venue to avoid being called to quote the uh, six babas to the dance floor by the mama baba. <laughs> but I'm not sure if, if I will succeed today. Um, so, but before we, we um, indulge in this ritual, we must bestow the honor of the Courage and Public Scholarship Award on this year's recipient. Uh, the, Courage of, the Courage and Public Scholarship Award was founded uh, kind of jointly by the NSSI Europe Collective and by the school, by New School for Social Research, uh, but also with um, support and uh, participation of the, the wider um, DCDS uh, network around the world. We've heard this morning that that network stands at about 1,700 individuals today. Um, when Ann Snitto, who, whose name was invoked so many times uh, during the day, received the inaugural award in 2015, uh, Barack Obama was president of the United States. Uh, Law and Justice Party was in opposition. <laughs> and the world in general was a, a little better place, perhaps, uh, at least for some. You be the judge of that. Um, the award presentation for Ann Snitto, an eminent feminist activist, scholar, and teacher from the New School, was hosted by the Polish Prime Minister's office by Małgorzata Puszara, then Secretary of State for, quote, equal treatment, unquote. Something, a notion that we should be in the uh, Mr. Morawiecki's office today, uh, I find unthinkable. <laughs> so the second award recipient in 2016 was another new school icon, Agnes Heller a distinguished philosopher, political theorist, and scholar whose um, ethical stance and writings uh, in the post-war period were an inspiration for generations, not only of uh, philosophy students, but many outside of the academy. The third recipient in 2017 was Ewa Wentowska, a distinguished Polish jurist and former member of Poland's Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, the award was in some way a response to the authoritarian turn in Poland and uh, many other places. It was only fitting that after the ceremony, as some of you recalled earlier today, we all took part in the street demonstration against the curtailment of judicial independence of Polish judges and, and courts. The fourth recipient in 2019, and the only one who, who uh, received the award in New York City, is the only one present today, the historian Jan Tomasz Gross, uh, who in large measure is responsible for changing 
the content and the terms of scholarly and public discourse about Polish-Jewish relations, including the Polish indifference to and complicity in the extermination of their Jewish neighbors during the Holocaust. The fifth recipient, the Turkish political activist Osman Kavala, was in prison at the time of the award in 2021. Uh, and the award was presented in a Zoom video conference, uh, was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment by the uh, Erdogan regime, remains in prison today, and the prospects for his release have been much diminished following the outcome of uh, last May's elections in Turkey. The award for Kavala, which is a white marble sculpture by a Wrocław-based Polish artist, uh, Tadeusz Wodarczyk, is still standing in the office of NSSA Dean, now Alex Alenikov, a reminder that the work of uh, defending democracy and human rights, our work, your work, is really never done or complete. And that, and that is why we are um, gathered here today, um, this evening, to acknowledge and honor another courageous public scholar, uh, one who is so dear to so many of us, both present here and with us in spirit around the world, literally around the world. Th thank you, Robert, for this, um, this context about the Courage in Public Scholarship Award and the, po uh, the, the, the honorable um, intellectuals uh, that this was bestowed upon. And now it's my pleasure uh, to invite uh, Professor Alenikov, uh, the new Dean of NSSR since uh, July 15th. Uh, he took the, the who's, who's going to make uh, some remarks and also announce the, um, the person that is uh, accepting, I hope, <laughs> has accepted uh, the Courage in Public Scholarship uh, Award. Sixth edition. Thank you. I don't think it will be much of a surprise, but what a day this has been. Yeah. Right? And Robert just uh, mentioned that uh, the work uh, that this institute is devoted to goes on and on. And I've heard some noise in the last uh, couple of weeks that this might be our last, uh, our last institute. I wonder what the crowd thinks about that. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, We'll have discussions back in New York uh, about, uh, about that, but uh, let me begin. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, students, distinguished guests, graduates, supporters of the Institute, and I think this describes all of us, friends of Elzbieta Matinia. It's wonderful to see so many people here today. I'm grateful to you who participated in the panels and for many of you who traveled great distances uh, to be here. I'm a relatively new member of the Institute family, having taught here four years ago, uh, and then again this year. And over the course of the past several days, I've met uh, many of you whose association extends back decades. Uh, and of course, it's my pleasure uh, to have the Institute's co-founder, uh, Jeff Goldfarb, with us tonight as well. You know, uh, academic programs come and go, and what seems urgent at one moment often fades as yesterday's news. Uh, but this institute has grown and adapted over 30 years. 30 years uh, holding on to old friends and adding new devotees every year. And this year's topic, Beyond Violence, fits perfectly with both the intellectual tradition of the institute and at the same time, it addresses deep issues of academic uh, and real world interest today. You know, we're, we're more than a group of people who have shared an experience. Uh, we're members of an organic, vibrant community of scholars, teachers, practitioners, activists, and a community that continues to grow together and to learn together. This didn't happen by chance. Networks are not naturally built and sustained. They need to be tendered, I'm sorry, tended and nurtured 
and continuously inspired. And everyone here tonight knows who has been the nurturer in chief. <laughs> Elzbieta, your vision, your energy, your ability to bring people in and keep them close, to make connections and bridges that expand the opportunities of others, it's legendary, it's unique. We are all the beneficiaries of your remarkable efforts over these many years. And tonight is our chance to thank you. Tonight we recognize the contributions you have made to scholarship and the academic profession and the pursuit of a better world and, dare I say it, to truth. For tonight, you receive the NSSR Europe Collective Courage in Public Scholarship Award. I have been Dean of the New School for Social Research for all of five days. <laughs> but I know that no matter how long I hold that position, no award will be more deserved and no evening will be more joyous. Elspieta, we learn from you, even the Polonaise. We are inspired by you and we love you. Thank you. Elspieta, please, thank you. Elzbieta, please, sorry, if you could take the seat on this, yes, please, here. And uh, as a person that appreciates uh, fine and sophisticated things, uh, you are actually sitting in a unique uh, piece from the Stern family collection that is designed by the famous designer Hans Polzig. So enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and now it's my particular pleasure to invite on stage Irena Grudzinska Gross, who, for those who don't know, made her entrance into public life and activism in the late uh, 60s in uh, Poland. Uh, she was an active member of the students' movement at that time. She's held academic positions in, uh, the, in several US institutions, and now it's with the Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, Irena is uh, gonna deliver the laudation uh, for Elzbieta. Thank you. Nothing that you will hear here is going to surprise you uh, because you heard it before, but this is an official document <laughs> and uh, therefore it's, uh, it has been certified. Uh, so uh, this is okay. Uh, and now? Uh, yeah, okay. So it is difficult to embrace the entirety of what Elżbieta Martynia has created, literally cre created, pulled into the world out of non-existence. It is even difficult to enum enumerate the various manifestations of those uh, creations. She has mentored uh, hundreds of students, influencing their work and lives. She has established several institutions which have become a lifeline for countless individuals. To do so, she crossed borders, border lines between countries and regimes. She has organized hundreds of conferences and seminars, of special courses and workshops. She has written books and articles, as well as tons of letters of recommendation and grant proposals. <laughs> she has made others write books and articles and <laughs> letters of recommendation and grant proposals. <laughs> she has inspired research and also political mediation and negotiations. She has helped redefine terms such as democracy. She has created places where the search for such definitions could and can be held in peace and quiet. She has ex uh, opened her home to countless guests and together with Dick Adams, 
made everybody welcome. Both of them have nurtured many stranded visitors and magnificently brought up their wonderful son, Timothy Martinia Adams. And this is only the beginning of <laughs> what can be said about Elisabetta Martinia, a professor, a mentor, a hostess, a force of nature, a friend. Uh, Elżbieta comes from the proud city of Starachowice. She was a student in the old Polish People's Republic, yet she made the best of the situation, as she always does. Uh, Professor Jerzy Szatski was her mentor, and she received her PhD degree in 1979. A year later, she was invited on a fellowship to the New School for Social Research in New York, but as she could only, she could only go there a year later, she was able to participate in the Solidarity Movement in Poland, which was a, form a formative experience for her, as we all know. Soon after her arrival in the United States, martial law was imposed on, on her native, in her native Poland, and that made her remain abroad as an exile. She held a two-year fellowship at the New School, taught at Bart College and Sarah Lawrence, but quickly came back to the New School, where she found a permanent uh, home. She is now professor of sociology and liberal studies at the New School, as well as the founding director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies. The name of the center expresses the essence of her work. Transregional really translates into borderless, an open space of searching for the ways in which democracy can be understood promoted and sustained. In her work, she does not forget gender and is particularly attentive to the issue of war and violence. She masterfully involves numerous and most diversified actors in her work. Her collaborators and students are her partners. Part of her energy is directly trans transmitted to them. The two regions Elżbieta is particularly concentrated on are East Central Europe and South Africa. In these two regions, she has held summer and winter programs of seminars devoted to democratic processes, gender and feminism. She has also written on, this, on these issues. Let me mention here her 1995 book, uh, Grappling, uh, sorry. <laughs> grappling with the democracy that we've seen uh, shown uh, here. Uh, she was given this, the copy of this book, uh, rare, rare now. Uh, and especially her even more important achievement, her 2009 performative democracy. The eponymous term has become part of vocabulary of contemporary sociology. We should also remember the beautiful, and also here mentioned in this last panel, uh, her collection of conversations between Václav Havel and uh, Adam Michnik. Indeed, Adam Michnik is one of Elżbieta's close friends, and she and Dick often hosted him when he came to New York. She has delivered several distinguished lectures and is a recipient of numerous awards and honors her contribution to the life of the new school is truly hard to quantify. She's a great scholar and at the same time a great academic animator whose energy is felt at her home institution and beyond it. The Courage in Public Scholarship Award is particularly fitting given Elżbieta's activities. The award recognizes both academic work and a special social attitude, a special kind of presence in society. Uh, here I enumerate the previous uh, awardees, uh, Anne Snittow, Agnes Helder, Eva Wentoska, Jan Tomasz Gross, and Osman Kavala. Uh, they have distinguished themselves by breaking barriers in their intellectual pursuits and in their public stance. Elżbieta is fearless in her work, 
and in her actions. She wrote without paying homage to the established authority. She traveled where it was dangerous to go. For example, she crossed on foot the border between Macedonia and Kosovo a few days after the Kosovo War ended. Dragging a small suitcase and smuggling in some German marks and with me in tow, <laughs> she braved the danger to deliver support for independent media. Was I afraid? Not with her. <laughs> she has a special aura around her with a powerful, positive, emotional charge. Yes, her temp temperature scale is from warm to extremely hot, <laughs> and that can produce hurricanes. Thankfully, she direct directs this energy so that we have a good climate change. <laughs> Thank you, Elżbieta, and congratulations. Mm -hmm. This award could not possibly have a better recipient. say something, but um, if uh, whatever I will say will be incredibly anticlimactic after whatever happened this morning, uh, this ar around noon and right now. So just bear with me because um, I just need your support. This is not going to be something that you didn't know what I would say. <sighs> Have you ever seen Endgame? Uh, no, no, I, I don't mean Avengers Endgame, a film from the <laughs> Avengers series. This, this only knows the young generation, really, but uh, I just have to tell others who don't, in which a, a band of superheroes, energized by fast action and hyper-special effects, fight, fight to restore a universe left in ruins by the titan Thanos. Then game I'd like you to look at with me now is, of course, the theater piece by Samuel Beckett, a slow-paced play with minimal decor, an armchair, not that armchair, uh, on wheels, armchair on wheels, two ash bins, two small windows with curtains, uh, with, uh, and a picture hung facing the wall. Uh, and just as the reality on stage is uh, reduced to a minimum, so, uh, so are the bodies and the bodily capacities of the four characters. Ham can't see and can't walk, hence the wheelchair. Clover, his servant, can't sit down. And Ham's parents, Nag and Nell, have no legs in that we only see their heads and hands sticking out from the two ash bins. And we know from Clove, as he looks through the window, that there is absolutely nothing behind the window, beyond the window, nothing. Even the sky seems empty. Well, such a radical redu uh, redu reduction decreed by Beckett for the stage do free up some space for imagination. In fact, the only fully free and unrestrained element in Endgame is imagination. The imagination of the characters and the imagination of the audience. Our imagination. The characters, especially Ham and Clove, can use their imagination to try to recreate a world they once knew. But even this is difficult as they are getting old and their capacity, remember, is also reduced. In their effort to recreate the past, Ham and his parents can only come up with a few traces of little importance. And then there is the audience, us, who must try, uh, try to make uh, something of, of, out of all of this, but we too, have little to go on. In one of his, I will come back to end the game in a second, but we are in Wrocław and somebody, and, and the Babas 
uh, read Tadeusz Różewicz, an uh, incredible poem. Uh, this is a poet who lived most of his life here in Wrocław. And when I was thinking about it last night, I thought that I, 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 I it, it, and I, I loved him, I loved his poem, poetry. Uh, I thought that I should, that it would help me to think about what I'm to think about. Um, uh, because when he describes in one of his poems, po he said that the only way, the only way to describe food is by describing hunger. Um, Beckett uses a similar approach. He's trying to capture something by describing its loss and absence. And that, that's, that is what moves the plot. Lost time is a paradise lost. A sequ um, but when, when, when it did exist, it was not such a paradise. It was just normal life, a sequence of events like many others, perhaps even happy. But it exists no more, except in our minds, lingering on in a very faint form. And this is the only topic of conversation for those on the stage. The standard interpretation of the end game um, is that it is the final part of the chess game, when few pieces remain on the board. The past is unclear, the present goes in fuel circles, and it seems that, by default, the play is oriented toward the future, toward what will come next. The question of the future is uh, what kind of end lies ahead? Yet there is no doubt that Endgame is an ultimate account of despair. As we watch it, we see a humanity on stage that is bleak and desolate. Adorno has suggested that the play uh, takes part in a zone of indifference. I'd like us to keep this in mind, but I don't, I don't think today we are exactly in a zone of indifference, at least not yet. Rather, we are living in the midst of bewildering change and struggle aimed at political reorganization that totally rejects uh, modern political principles and that many, among them my late mentor, Jerzy Szatski, that Irena just mentioned, he encapsulated as democracy and this, and this secular nation state. Except that this bewildering change and struggle are heightened by the confluence of cataclysmic climate change and a return of violent discourse and processes fueled by racism, ethno-nationalism, xenophobia, everything what you were talking about this morning, um, which frame people fleeing for their lives as invasive others all on the top of the crushing experience of the pandemic, vicious cultural wars, and that new old war that we spoke so much here about. Just 602, Jeffrey, 602 kilometers and 374 miles away from here. Today, well, though surrounded by this, uh, there was also commented here on this, largely man-made fires, we are at least, I think we, we've been at least tr trying to put them out. It would be so much easier, though, to fight these fires if they were not fueled by massive efforts to dismantle the order, democratic order we were all dreaming on and we thought we, are, we achieved, by using voter suppression and rolling back existing rights, all of, all of which leaves us in a state of reduce, reduced democracy, which brings us back to Beckett play. But instead of just contemplating the end game, perhaps we could try to think how to reverse it. But does reversal necessarily mean to go straight back to the past, which sounds problematic and conservative for me at least. So let me start with one promising beginning that mobilized me and, uh, and many, many others, and many of them are here. Um, which still functions as a potent social imaginary endowed with the power to make things happen, to create, to enact, to constitute social reality. Indeed, uh, that kind of imagination was an activity of both representing and, and doing. 
I experienced this personally, and you know, everybody was talking about it, so I'm not going to go to, to great length to say, but I was this aspiring sociologist in Warsaw. That's when it happened. Sadly, it became increasingly difficult for me to talk about it afresh, um, as the story uh, has been told so many times that whatever is left feels stodgy and dull. But it was not. I want, you, I want to promise you, it was not. We and um, so many others felt enormously alive and happy in experiencing daily the meaning of solidarity with a small s and being able to, to act upon it. In a world, in the world, it was unquestionably the formative experience of, uh, of my life and many other lives, and there is a reason that I'm talking about it here. Uh, as a person, as a citizen, a, a magnificent gift that I still carry with me. Uh, I, I remember distinctly feeling a, a kind of twinge of regret um, as I really, wa I, I really wanted to come to the United States and learn English and, um, and you know, be able to be a kind of a better informed sociologist more. But I remember the twinge of regret as I was leaving Poland for a, for a scholarship um, uh, in New York at uh, the new school that I had just left that I just, just left a place of tangible hope. Uh, many years later, um, I marveled in the book I, that was mentioned here, I marveled at the societal capacity to maintain the peaceful character of that movement, um, even when it was delegalized and forced underground, and to re-enter eight years later into a public discourse which the authoritarian regime, the, through uh, which a consensus on the transition to democracy could be reached, made this uh, public dialogue possible and, uh, and um, an authoritarian reality was gone. Revolutions can be negotiated, I argued. The revolution of 1989 was a whole new kind of revolution, one that delivered hope without bloodshed, people could replace violence with speech action, and realize its agency through instruments other than weapons. And it seems the world noticed, at least for a while, that, that exhilarating experience of an upper path for various nonviolent rights revolutions that followed over more than three decades, orange, green, revolution of the roses, uh, Arab Spring, uh, uh, Maidan, the last Maidan, with people assembling in uh, public squares to peacefully defy oppressive regimes in various corners of the world. But today there looms another experience we all share, that of return of protracted political violence and, and this year's institute was really about that. It is, it is, it is um, now more than three decades later, in post-communist, three, decade, three decades of post-communist Poland, that various parts of carefully built democratic infrastructure are being gradually reduced to a Potemkin village. For people like me, these two kinds of experiences are locked, uh, as it were, in a mounting struggle between social hope and social despair. Scholars, books, curricula, and knowledge um, itself are under attack. And new processes of silencing are set up to serve the closing down of minds. Note that I'm talking here not only about my country of origin, but also about my adopted country, adopted homeland. As I try to think about what, what went wrong, uh, known as I am for being a notorious sucker for hope, albeit Secular, secular hope. I wonder what uh, the conditions are today that could generate trust rather than suspicion. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to think about of ways in which we can restart the way in which to restart. I'm not, I'm not looking for optimism or a positive, positive outlook. We, we talked about it here in Wrocław in that class that I had on romancing violence. I'm not trying to look for that not for optimism, as I believe that Havel was indeed right when he said, hope is not an optimism that things will turn out well, but a certainty that something is meaningful, 
regardless of how it turns out. The certainty gains its power from the fact, one could argue, that it unfolds in the present through ex definition immeasurably short, uh, that is intrinsic value, it's, it, it's intrinsic value, a, a value that transcends whatever outcome, good or bad, may happen tomorrow. That kind of hope may well be, uh, have been shared by the almost 40,000 foreign volunteers who in the late 1930s went to Spain, a battleground then for the soul of Europe to fight against fascism. But with the help of Hitler and Mussolini, Franco won the battle, and the lessons many volunteers learned along the way were, were already actually disturbing. In Barcelona, writes Orwell in the spring of 1937, he was straight from the Aragon front, in Barcelona, there was a peculiar evil feeling in the air, an atmosphere of suspicion, fear, uncertainty, and veiled hatred. However little you were conspiring, the atmosphere forced you to feel more like a conspirator. You seem to spend all your time holding whispered conversations in corners of cafes and wondering whether the person at the next table was a police spy. Sinister rumors of all kinds were flying around thanks to the press censorship. And you had um, all the time uh, a hateful feeling that um, who was once your friend might be denouncing you to the secret police. I'm talking about it because closer to home, I, I knew about this hope, the hope that, that volunteers went to Spain to fight with, and, but, but also this kind of hope of my young parents' generation a hope that came on the heels of the workers' rebellion against communist rule known as 1956, post-9 June, the last armed uprising in Poland. Through the protest, the protest was, was, was brutally suppressed. It, um, uh, its after, aftermath seemed to open up a possibility for more air and or, or for some freedoms. A few months later, Somebody already mentioned, I, I, I think it was Slavko, but I don't remember, you know, on October 23, when the Hungarian Revolution erupted, uh, only to be crushed by Soviet tanks, Poland appeared to be on its way to becoming a more peaceful, hopeful, and autonomous place with the, within the Soviet bloc. The state censorship office even ceased to function for a year or so. But uh, two years later, 1958, when a young PhD candidate who taught psychology at the University of Lille arrived to work at the French Cultural Center in Warsaw, he found himself caught in a palpably Orwellian experience. His name was Michel Foucault, and his own account captures vividly the resurgence of fear in the country. In the, I'm quoting, the silences of everyday, everyday gestures of a Paul who knew he was being watched, who waited to be out on the street before telling you something, because he knew very well there, there were microphones everywhere in the foreigner's apartment. In the way the voices were lowered when you were in the restaurants, uh, in the way letters were burned. It was in all these suffocating gestures, wrote Foucault later, as well as in the savage, raw violence of the Tunisian police beating down on a university students. And this dual Poland-Tunisia experience balanced my own political experience, he writes, and also referred me on to things that basically I had not sufficiently suspected in my pure speculations. The importance of the exercise of power, the lines of contact between body, life, discourse, and political power. Foucault reminds us how much of our work, of what we stand for, is indeed grounded in our personal experiences and motivations. And this takes me back to Havel, a, a longtime political prisoner who, for whom hope was a mindset based on making our lives meaningful and relevant. I've always wondered whether his notion of hope 
that is the certainty that something we do is meaningful um, will necessarily make us similarly noble, you know, similarly to share similarly noble objectives. Though I, I, I know his hope is not an optimism um, about the best possible outcomes. I'd like to be a bit more pragmatic here. Hope is when violence, where violence is not. Hope, powered by a sense of caring responsibility, is to face reality as it is and to wrestle with it because it matters. But to do this, we need, we need an infrastructure anchored in the present, keeping in mind the past, and not bound exclusively to the future. So what is the infrastructure of hope? Let's see whether these personal motivations I just talked about may help us here. For some time already, I've been working, many of you know about, on the project um, disturbed by long COVID and other things, uh, prompted by personal motivations. My sense, and what was this personal motivation? My, my sense of bewilderment, loss, and shame when I learned that a fellow Paul of my generation for whom the formative experience was dialogue as a tool of political change, had committed a political murder, murder in 1993 to stop the peaceful negotiations to end, an, uh, to end apartheid in South Africa. How could a Paul of, you know, just like me, be recruited to conspire against democracy, against the very principles of emancipatory politics, I presumed he must have stood for in our homeland. The political murder I'm talking about was the assassination of Chris Hani, the beloved attack, a black anti-apartheid leader considered Mandela, Mandela's most likely successor, who at the time of his death was the first secretary of the South, uh, South African Communist Party. The assassin, a self-proclaimed anti-communist emigre from Poland, was quickly caught by the police. His sentence was life imprisonment, and 30 years later, He's still locked up in high security prison in Pretoria when I met him twice. The assassination was one of those shocking events that became central to the collective memory of South Africans of all colors and political affiliations who remember the exact circumstances in which they learned about Hani's killing. As big as, uh, this, the, as, as, big as this mystery remains, despite the court trial, uh, truth and reconciliation hearings, and efforts to reveal perhaps a larger plot that he was a part of. My own interest in what had happened was originally motivated by a, by a different kind of mystery. Again, what in the world, world drew the assassin from distant country into a mission designed to kill both a man and the hope of, remaining, of, of remaking South Africa into a into a democracy. The very ideal, I thought, the perpetrator himself might have fought for, as I said. Was I naive to insist that ours was a life transforming and deeply ethical experience that transcended all our own well known national, our own very well known, broadly known national egoism? At that time, we had a clear sense that, uh, that, that, that each of us had invested completely in in challenging the cruelty of the regime. I'm really talking about the solidarity period, right? So it's 19, 1980 to 89, 81. Um, uh, in, so we were challenging the regime in reclaiming our right, our right to have rights by audacious, audaciously building alternative institutions, a project that gradually made the state almost irrelevant. We had been shaped by, the new, by a new hope of our own making. We discovered each other. We discovered a life with dignity. And, and we all got a taste of public freedom. I vividly remember how we had the uncanny sense that day by day, we were actually becoming a better human beings. Cuba, as the assassin was called by his family and friends, had grown up just 50 kilometers from the place I grew, grew up in and found himself abroad, albeit for different reasons, at the same time I did, as I did. He must have had a somewhat similar experience, I presume, naively, yes, naively, but as it turns out, naively. How could it be, I wondered, 
that what constitutes the realm of hope for, for the people in one part of the world could be seen as, um, by, by one of their own as, as an imminent realm of hopelessness in another. Why did he try to kill the hope of others? Needless to say, I do understand the power of anti-communist resentments, presumably brought along from Poland by the assassin, ostensibly a political refugee. I myself, um, somebody who become intrigued uh, and familiar with uh, South Africa's present and past, was always perplexed by the striking different uh, roles played by the communist parties in those two very different context. I, I do understand that it takes an effort to get rid of one's own prejudices and fixations. At the same time, I wondered whether the eulogized Polish cultural idiom that thrives on the theme of individual sacrifice and heroic deeds against the enemy didn't play some role in that as well. I, I wondered what the assassin's real comprehension of the apartheid system was. I have rummaged through various cases of political assassination and I am absolutely aware of, of, of uh, um, its chronically misconstrued ideological motivations. Did Cuba even know any Africans? Had, had, had he ever visited a black township? Was he as simple-minded? a common racist at something? Or was it perhaps is he, his English um, inadequate in his testimonies and trial, trials? The skeptical that, that the assassin was motivated by hatred and communism, and uh, of communism, the whole exercise made me consider yet another direction. In one of her essays, written in 1990, my favorite South African writer, Nadine Gordimer, talked about that defining events of the century, and for her it was um, the events which were dominated by the fall of the communism and the end of colonialism, which best expresses the apparently common malady, the inability to conceive otherwise, as she put it. I don't want to bore you, I, I, would, I, prom I, I don't have to promise, I will finish this book one day. Um, um, uh, I realize um, that it wasn't just so she, she, she visited, she visited the United States, and I thought that it wasn't just her, but it's, and it's not just the ass assassin, it's not, I'm talking about those prejudices, it's also me. Despite my own history of association with South Africa and real attachment and love to the place, I encountered my own limitations in making sense of and being open to accepting an experience that wasn't mine. That was the story which Gordimer as well, uh, of Gordimer as well, when she came to the United States on a book tour. Her novel was entitled Bur Burger's Daughter. It's a story of Lionel Burger, an Afrikaner, who through becoming a communist devoted his life and the life of his entire family, white family, to the liberations of South Africa from apartheid. While in the States, Gordimer noticed that Burger was continuously referred to as a liberal. Um, one, uh, on, on one of the most watched TV shows, she interrupted the famous host and said, no, 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 he's not, he, he, he was not a liberal, he's not a liberal, he is a communist. But it was useful. None of these people read me, she, she, uh, she observed, because uh, in the eth ethos of mainstream American society, communists could never be, no matter in what country or social circumstances a good man. This is not a matter of misreading or, or misunderstanding. It is a substitution of one set of values for another because the reader cannot conceive of these otherwise. When I read Gordimer Reflections from her American tour, I found in them a confirmation of my own sense of something that um, had been bugging me for some time already, which I struggled to name. Not misreading or misunderstanding, but simply something different, uh, a misknowing. Misknowing that is knowing without questioning that knowledge, knowing uncritically and thus erroneously. Indeed, misknowing starts with the absence of questioning one's own self-knowledge and one's own certainty. 
to go through the layers of something that appears to be similar and then to discover that it is really, it's not, requires effort and takes time. The very process of trying to find out, uh, to process what appears to be facts, to interrogate and penetrate them, to make temporal and spatial connections, to recognize idioms and symbols, to grasp metaphors, to start figuring out what others' worlds are about, is not always fully successful, since knowing and misknowing are very close cousins. I often wonder what Arendt, my own guiding spirit, would say about all of that. I have talked to her students and I learned you know, various things about her. Um, would she laugh at my self-conscious an easy perplexity over the case of an assassination and my clumsy efforts to work out a distinction that might help me to understand what I think is not yet sufficiently understood? Well, the trouble is that uh, Arendt was not particularly interested in the phenomenon of knowing. It was, it was thinking that fascinated her, the realm of uh, unanswerable questions, elusive meanings, and therefore a realm of unlimited freedom. Knowing is a more finite process, with the beginning and an end, with no room for sustained dialogue that might result in an unpredictable disclosure. Still, I believe that the quest for knowing drives away ignorance, and I think Arendt must have uh, appreciated its interim appeal in her early essay where she refers to knowing as inarticulate preliminary understanding. Let me leave the theory uh, behind, but, but, uh, but uh, perhaps what's more important for us today is that knowing, or rather the ways we get to know, unlike thinking, is not a private affair. Instead, it is socially produced and it's tightly connected to the reality we live in as in today's living bubbles, for example, phenomenon. I, I, I would like to argue that reflection on the circumstances that facilitate misknowing might help us to illuminate some of the grounds of acute conflicts in today's world. Well, in the assassination of Chris Hani, there were, of course, other forces that work before not knowing enough, and not wanting to know, knowing erroneously. To explore these is to explore forces of violence, uh, working towards a distortion of reality, such as the production of the big lie. And uh, these forces are not necessarily inevitable. I like to think that the condition of misknowing, potentially calamitous, is avoidable and perhaps even preventable. It is a condition that corrupts, or rather prevents, thinking and that can affect our actions and that therefore invites urgent reflections. In the meantime, New sets of questions have become more urgent with the recent emergence of a new electoral author authoritarianism that is one dressed in the democratic garb, right? So what, what are the social arrangements that contribute to the eradication of politics and thus open up a path, for, a path to violence? How is it that one of our own, a talented uh, philosopher from Lublin, who has been working on the problem of hospitality, as the foundation for democracy, was taken to court for writing a public letter addressed to the rector of the university. And what was his crime? He was protesting the decision to award a medal of honor to a public official known for speaking openly against Ukrainian and Muslim refugees, for calling gender the, an enemy ideology, for inviting public expressions of racism, xenophobia, and homophobia in Poland. I should add that since the trial uh, that, some public that the same public official has been promoted to a uh, member of parliament and then eventually to the, he's right now minister of education in this country. So here we are, and whenever we are, wherever we are, we are facing policies, practices, and modalities to re that remove voices, confiscate questions, outlaw encounters between people, prohibit discussions, and produce a strangely mute theater of public life. Let me finish with a question that I will try to answer. So what at, what at last is the infrastructure of hope? Is there any? I should ask Krzysztof to answer this question um, because we are kind of 
both, I think, I don't know who more, addicted to the story of this 14th century bridge. I told that story with Jeff, uh, with, we had a conference for Jeff this um, spring, last spring. So I'd like to take you to this 14th century bridge and those of you who, who, who know me well know my yeah, fixation on that. The main character, the bridge is the main character in the novel by Yugoslav writer Ivo Andrić. Um, I'm looking at Krzysztof Czeski here. And I'm sorry that Mangosia is not here. Um, uh, and I'm thinking about the borderlands. Um, I'm thinking about the borderlands in the northeastern Poland. So what is the, what's the big deal with this bridge? As envisioned by the builder, once you reach the middle of, of, of it, it suddenly doubles in width to allow for something more than just crossing, uh, uh, crossing it on foot or horseback. I'm attracted to this in part because of the physical hospitality of the space, the stone sofas on the side, um, on each side, so that people can can rest and stand and and the stand with a brass brass um, Turkish coffee maker, the co presence of others, but also because of its visceral activity uh, qualities. We all smell the water, the coffee, the horses, and we hear the sound of shoes wheels on the, uh, of the vehicles and marching soldiers of the old wars as they look at each other, especially at each other's feet, aching feet. feet. And, and, and they find um, they can sit down on the stone sofas, look around, and gradually begin talking to each other. Well, here, uh, here we are in an immersive kind of theater where the public and the actors are one, or there is very little distinctions, an organic bridging experience, the experience of encountering others whom we otherwise would not have met. The experience is the opposite of the one offered, by, uh, uh, offered us by Beckett, by Beckett's characters, and their space in Endgame. The world does not end here. The utter loneliness is gone. The capilla, this plaza in the middle of the bridge, makes it possible for people to get to feel somewhat at home with each other, learning to look through each other's eyes, asking where they come from, asking them of their, their homes. Um, and, and that is how seeds of trust are planted. We, we know that conversation is always voluntary. Uh, Marcy was talking about conversation today. It's and not necessary. First, we have to agree to talk, to listen to each other's stories, and through this, to get to know each other. Uh, Paul Ricoeur suggested that everybody can narrate, and that together, through small narratives, um, we can clear a path that advances us on our conversation. And, and, and that, with this ability to narrate, one is able to give a uh, an account, and therefore feel accountable. Well, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to, to so far as to say that properly situated conversation brings about the restoration of all things, apocatastasis, right? But um, not yet. Uh, however, I do believe in the power of exchange stories, so they, they set in motion, a gradual abstraction from personal desires, aims, lenses, and filters, and lead to recognizing matters that are meaningful and that we have in common. I have to give a prom promote uh, Helena Schleifer's new book. I mean, she was one of the editors of Extraordinary Book, which is kind of about that, but goes deeper and is much more pr practical. Uh, it will be translated, I think we have to translate in English, okay. So when, when we think about the infrastructure, we often think about roads and bridges, and when we think about the infrastructure of hope, we should think about Capilla, a vital space for meeting, exchanging stories, and chipping away at misknowing. We all know spaces that are like that, don't we? We all, we all know a Capilla, a space someone has built uh, that may seem unessential, unnecessary, even redundant, I'm sure Krzysztof wrote about that. And, and we know it performs an awesome role. If you have not been to Borderlands Insane and Krasnogruda, go and be there for a while. 
This is our earth side of hope, constituted exclusively by bridges with kapias, where multiple languages, ideas, narratives, and melodies help us to break the entrenched certainty of knowing. When I think about Kapia, I often think about Tomek Kitliński, I already mentioned him about name here, and his work on gościnność, hospitality to otherness, hospitality to difference, with no host, a, a place with no host, yet hospitable to all diversity. Uh, Rereading Arendt's human, human condition today, one, one could make the case that generating the conditions for both plurality and hospitality ought to be seen as the ultimate incubator and sustainer of public life. Um, I remember writing a long, I'm about to finish. I remember writing a, a long uh, time ago about Manifa, a carnavalesque theatrical women's solidarity parade march that has been taking place in, in Polish cities every March 8th since 1997. Agnieszka, 1997, a kind of recurrent kapia. Agnieszka Graf, who was here and speaking uh, in the panel, just preceding panel, and, and some others of you that you might know, will know more about it, but what I wanted to only to say is that kapia doesn't have to be a space, but it's also time. Kapia is also an event that radiates happiness, a public happiness, and uh, that transcends or expands the presence into boundlessness. I, I, do, I, I think about it very institute of ours, such a perennial, perennial cup, yeah? I think I have to stop. I just have five sentences, let me finish, okay. So, there, I, I dropped some. There was no democracy in, in this country yet when, we, when you know, before nine, before, uh, even when we began the Institute 1991, there was really, you know, it's hard, hardly any experience of that. Um, there was a pandemic in the meantime, and we met online. So 30 institutes that happened in the meantime, one of them was online. A surprisingly intense experience for me, but I think also for people who took place in it. But in the meantime, and this has been a good meantime, I wanted to thank you for, for, for building it and, uh, and for not letting it crumble. Uh, I've seen how each year we make really good use of it here in Wrocław, as we did in Cape Town and Johannesburg. Nadim Gordimer promised, this is the last sentence, Nadim Gordimer, you've noticed, she's one of those people that I really like, I mean the writers that I really like, I'm very attached to her, she said wisely, Men are not brothers. They have to discover each other. Well, right here, that's exactly what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elzbieta. It was such a pleasure listening to, to your very interesting and sophisticated uh, um, um, lecture remarks, whatever you want to call them. It, I, for me, thank you so much for making me part of this. And we have now two more beautiful, brief moments in this ceremony. Uh, the first uh, one is a video by the artist Tadeusz uh, uh, Vlodarczyk, who has prepared uh, the actual symbol of the award, uh, which couldn't be here with us. Uh, so please, if we could watch the video. Szanowna pani profesor, droga Elżbieto, fortuna dała mi wreszcie szansę odwrócenia losu i zrobienia czegoś dla ciebie. Podjąłem zadanie z zamiarem sprostania. Marmur z Karary i drewno z Nowego Świata znalazła Julieta. Całość nieduża, ale wytyczne klasyczne. Proporcja, symetria, harmonia z uśmiechem, empatii i sympatii, bo to dla ciebie, o tobie. Ta widoczna na zdjęciach rzeźba będzie na ciebie czekać w domu. Byłoby nieludzkie wskazywać cię na latanie po świecie z kamieniem w bagażu, zwłaszcza, 
że to nie diament albo choćby szafir. Te najcenniejsze skarby masz teraz wokół siebie, twoich przyjaciół i uczniów. One i oni są nagrodą za twoje odważne serce dla świata. Żałujemy z Rujetą, że nie możemy być teraz z tobą. Spotkamy się przy innej okazji. Serdecznie ci gratulujemy wyróżnienia i przede wszystkim dziękujemy. And I will, this is the award. This is what, what it looks like, beautiful. And I will read the translation of, of his um, uh, greetings, remarks. Dear Professor, dear Elżbieta, fortune finally gave me a chance to reverse the situation and do something for you. I took on the task with the intention of meeting it. Carrara marble and wood from the new world were found by Juliet. The whole thing is small, but with classical guidelines, uh, proportion, symmetry, and harmony. The smile shows sympathy and affection because it is about you, for you. The piece, visible in the uh, photos, will be waiting for you at home. It would be inhumane to condemn you to fly around the world with a stone in your luggage, especially since it's not a diamond or even a sapphire. You now have the most precious treasures around you, your friends and students. They are the reward for the mighty heart you share with the world. Juliet and I regret that we cannot be with you right now. We'll meet soon. We congratulate you on this recognition. Above all, we thank you, Tadek and Juliet. Elżbieta, here are some pictures of the award. And uh, now uh, it is my pleasure uh, to invite uh, another uh, uh, NSSR and TCDS alumni and member of the NSSR uh, Europe Collective, a person that has played an important role in publishing Elżbieta's work and the work of uh, many uh, new school authors in Polish, Lothar uh, Rasinski. And he has a little, another surprise. <laughs> Elżbieta, I promise that this is last surprise for today. <laughs> I'm not sure actually, but let's say official <laughs> surprise. Uh, so, um, there is an expression in Polish Tajemnica Poliszynela. The secret of Poliszynel. Um, I'm not sure if it exists in English at all, uh, but it means uh, in Polish a public secret. Uh, this is a situation when everybody knows about something, <laughs> but nobody speaks about it publicly. So I think that uh, working on this book Will, thank you. Um, so, the working on this book last couple of months uh, could be called Tajemnica Polishinella, in fact. Because you were the only one who didn't know, I hope you didn't know, about it. <laughs> and all of us here had to be very careful uh, not to talk about it in public so that you couldn't find out about the project. So, Elżbieta, let me present you the book, right? I already presented it. Let me finish, let me finish. Shall I say rather a tribute? 38 essays, reflections on you, on your scholarly and public work for cultivating democracy, written by your friends, colleagues, co-workers, and students. The title of the book is Elżbieta Mantynia, Enacting Public Hope. And I believe that it expresses well the very core of academic and public engagement. And I think uh, the next edition will uh, include your, your today's lecture, actually, which is in, about public hope, in fact, right? <laughs> okay, uh, I had the honor, I had the honor to be the book's editor and now I have the honor to hand it to you, which I already did. Thank you. Thank you.
Dank. Okay, this is another, this is another public speak. As, as, uh, so the last 30 years would not be possible without Elzbieta Matynia, but the last day would not be possible without Hannah Czerwinkowa. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Now, two important things. First, a very sacred, sacred uh, TCDS, Democracy and Diversity Institute uh, tradition. Everybody play, uh, dances the Polonaise. So we go here on the left, we first dance the Polonaise, and then there is the reception. Thank you everybody, thank you Hannah, thank you Elżbieta.